The Canadian government has launched a just transition uh, consultation process. And I'm going to be talking to Marla Ornstein, who is the natural resource uh, director of the Natural Resources Center for Canada West Foundation, about their submission to that process. So, welcome to the interview, Marla. Thank you so much. Now, this is a, an interesting initiative on the part of the the government because there's a lot of concern about uh, fossil fuel workers who will lose their jobs eventually as demand goes down for coal, oil, and gas. So, what are we going to do with them instead of leaving them to the vagaries of the market, as the you know say the Americans did with the uh, the Rust Belt uh, when manufacturing uh, changed in the uh, 80s and 90s? Uh, the idea is to plan for it. So what uh, can you give us an overview of uh, your organization submission to the government, please? Sure. I mean, as you as you say, Mark, and this is a really important topic. You mentioned the Rust Belt as being one example where we've seen a whole scale change of what was happening in industry that really left workers behind. It's not the only example. We can certainly think of what happened in Newfoundland with a fishing moratorium, um, Northeast England, when coal uh, was transitioned out, they still haven't recovered socially and economically decades later. Um, so there's very much a focus that we don't want the same thing to happen again, that as the energy transition happens and being driven in part by government, but not wholly, that we have hundreds of thousands of workers that could wind up without other jobs if, if sufficient planning isn't happening. And so that's why having a focus on this just transition is, is so critical right now. I, I would agree with that. And, uh, and especially your point about the energy transition being partly driven by uh, policy. But uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that the energy transition is also being driven by new technologies that, you know, like batteries and electric vehicles and wind and solar and so on. And it's unstoppable. This is not a policy driven any transition anymore, though policy plays an important role in the pace of the transition. So uh, there are four, pardon me? I was going to say, I completely agree, but but this is where I think that the just transition that's happening around the energy transition may be a little bit different than the Rust Belt or the, the Newfoundland fishing example, is that because it is, truly is a transition as opposed to just a winding down, you know, as you reference, all those other things are going to require workers as well. So it, it does uh, lead to a bunch of opportunity that is out there for the seizing if we can manage it right. That really didn't happen in Northeast England. It didn't happen in the Rust Belt, et cetera. Well, good point. Now, there are four uh, principles that underlie the uh, federal government's discussion paper on this. Could you briefly summarize those for us? If I can remember them correctly, it was that they were gonna, going to consult with uh, the regions that are affected. They were going to look to international best principles. They were going to ensure that the, um, the transition is fair in a way and doesn't just include people who previously had jobs, but also those who were sort of structurally or systemically left out from economic opportunities. And frankly, I don't remember the fourth one. Not a problem. That's uh, three out of four is uh, is very good. Uh, well, look, let's talk about the three additional principles that you, uh, you your brief suggests should be added to that. The first one is that just transition resources should be focused on the regions and communities directly impacted by job losses and closures. What do you mean by that? Well, we, we thought that what the, the government put down in, in their original principles, there was nothing wrong with any of them. There, there are certainly things that we could support, but they had some huge gaps missing, some fundamental principles around what was being done. And the analogy I've, I've made sort of semi-flippantly a couple of times right now is it's like you're trying to build a house and you say, well, what we really want is a nice garden in the front. We want excellent windows. I'd like the bathroom painted green and let's make sure to have the counters straight. Absolutely, all those things, but that itself is not sufficiently a plan that's gonna get you to, to where you want with a good structurally sound house. So this first one about making sure that the regions that are losing the jobs are also the regions that are gaining in jobs is critically important. Um, it doesn't really help if you have oil and gas jobs going from Alberta, but the new jobs are all tech and downtown Montreal. It means that people have to move. It means that communities get hollowed out. It means that skills may not be transferable. And that's when you wind up with these regionally depleted areas and ghost towns arising. So that first one is really about making sure that where things are coming out, things are also going in. Let's talk about the second principle that you suggest, that just transition must support workers, communities, and companies. Each has unique needs and all contribute to the prosperity of people. 
Yeah, it, it, we think that the first and the second are reasonably well recognized in the literature, that there needs to be a focus on people, the individual workers, and the types of supports that they need in terms of upskilling and retraining. We think that there is a reasonable focus on communities as well as, as people understand that as the economic base leaves, communities have a harder and harder time doing things like paying for firefighters, fixing the roads, keeping the schools open, et cetera. So those economic challenges certainly need to be met. But we also think that companies are and should be a focus of the transition as well. We have some excellent examples of companies that have managed to transition what they do, that take a hard look and say, what is it, are we really, are we a, 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 you know, are we a downhole driller or do we solve a certain type of problem that's a little bit broader? To the extent that you can help companies transition, it helps the people and it helps the communities because it keeps economic structures intact. It keeps networks intact. It keeps relationships intact. Um, all the things that a company do already does and has, it's much easier to, to use that in service of a different end than to, to just start from scratch and try to build companies from nothing. So we think that's, that's a really important element that shouldn't be missed. The third principle is that robust labor market information should be collected nationally to support identification of new employment opportunities for workers in regions directly impacted by job losses and closures. And one of the things I hear from economists, uh, particularly in Alberta, is the that Canada does a really bad job of, of uh, providing, doing economic analysis and providing information about its energy sector. I mean, you have the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which is, I mean, this is it's like, a you know, standing in front of a fire hose of information. And the Canadian Energy Regulator and Stats Canada, it's barely a garden hose. That, that's absolutely true. And the other place there's a big difference between Canada and the U.S. is on the labor market side itself where the US collects its labor market information down to, I can't remember if it's four digits or five digits, but we do it to one less, which means there's much less specificity for communities that are trying to look at their worker pool and say, what, what do people actually do? What are their competencies? What are their skills? And that's really critical information for all levels of the government to be able to make decisions about, well, how do we replace that? Um, in some places like Kentucky, for example, which again had a big decline after coal, they were able to put that labor market information to good use and say, well, what do people do? What can they do? And to decide to bring in, I believe it was, um, it was either pharmaceuticals or biomedical industry and the aerospace industry, because they had the sufficient grain of information to say, it only takes a little bit of upskilling to get from here to there. We don't have that level of information. And that's a big recommendation, less a principle more a recommendation that, that if across the country, we start collecting labor information down to that grain of detail, it'll make things easier for communities and, and municipalities, provinces, the federal government, community organizations, everybody will have that at their fingertips to be able to make those better decisions. Now, uh, Marla, I wanna get your take on an editorial position that Energy Media has taken. And that is that in the energy transition, this is not simply, it shouldn't be viewed this way, as a transition from coal, oil, and gas to electricity and low carbon uh, fuels like hydrogen. And the others uh, simply then fade off into, into history. There's an opportunity here to do things, other things with hydrocarbons. We can turn natural gas into, into hydrogen, blue hydrogen. We can turn bitumen into carbon fiber and asphalt binder and things. And it seems like those options, well, not hydrogen, everybody's interested in hydrogen, but other things to do with bitumen, for instance, in the oil sands, don't get as much attention. And I think that's a key missing part of this discussion. What's your take on that? Well, I, I would agree with you on that. That's that's probably less about the just transition, more about the energy transition in general. Um, I think that those are going to continue to be um, critical elements going forward. I think that, that a lot of prosperity can ride on trying to figure out creatively what we can do with what we already have in ways that don't fuel climate change. In terms of the just transition, whether the scale of that is able to replace the jobs that we already have, um, that's an open question in my mind. I don't, I don't have that information. I, I think we know that the demand for the product itself is, is, is right now it's, it's driven by combustion and that's gonna go down a lot. Um, but even if not as much product is going out, do we still have the same number of jobs? We might, we might not, um, open question from my perspective. 
Yes, I, I would agree with all of that. This is a very, you know, we're in a very disruptive time in the energy transition and much is unclear. We don't know, we, the trends are clear, but timing and how exactly they'll play out is, is very unclear. And uh, the idea of having a process where we could talk about them, plan for them, put policy in place for them to adapt just seems like a very sensible approach to me. So thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much, Mark.